You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, everyone. It's the Veterinary Rehabilitation Podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Megan Kelly. Today, I've got Ruth Mitchell Golliday. She's from the United States, and she's going to be talking to us about myofascial release and all about fascia. And now I went um, onto her website and she's got uh, um, her CV there. And I thought I'm going to do a really nice introduction of Ruth. And I looked at her CV and I can't even remember how many pages there were, but Ruth has studied so much. I actually became completely overwhelmed and I decided that I'm just going to leave it to Ruth um, just to chat about um, herself and her history and all the education that she's done. It's really unbelievable the, the amount of courses and certificates and studying that she's done. Welcome Ruth, lovely to have you on the show. Well thank you Megan very much. Your words are very very kind. Um, yeah I have been a licensed physiotherapist for 47 years and a licensed massage therapist for about 29 years. I'm nationally board certified here in the United States as a massage therapist, and I am also an equinology equine body worker. And over the past 47 years, I have taken over 2000 hours of continuing education. And I think that's exceedingly important for anyone who is going to practice to stay current with what's going on. At the present time, I treat humans, horses, and dogs, uh, as well as teaching for equinology and the sister companies throughout the world. Ruth, you know, um, fascia is something that, as a vet, I'm really interested in. And, um, you know, when I was at vet school, we really didn't learn much about it. And I can remember being in the anatomy hall and spending hours and hours and hours of just removing the fascia. Um, we weren't really taught anything about it, and I remember just finding it really difficult. At times, it was adhered to muscle, and if you cut a little bit of muscle off, then you lost marks. Um, but that was really the only um, you know, introduction that I had to fascia, and that was it. That was the last time I ever heard about it, and it was more a nuisance than anything else. I needed to get rid of it so I could learn the muscles um, and the, look at the blood vessels and nerves and things like that. So as a vet, Fascia is just so new to me, and only when I got into the field of veterinary rehabilitation did I start to learn about fascia and movement and um, how it how it can cause pain in in our patients. Yeah, and interestingly, when I went to physio school uh, forty, well, it would have been forty nine years ago since I've been practicing for forty seven years. I had the exact same experience you did. They would tell us in the anatomy lab go ahead and get rid of all that white stuff so that we can get to the quote unquote real structures. And we used to break scalpels trying to cut through some of it because of course in in the uh, dog or horse or human uh, who is dead, it's much, much harder than it is when they are living. And it's interesting to look back now and say to myself, why didn't one of us say, well, what is all this white stuff we're trying to get rid of? I mean, why is it here in the body if it's meaningless and we have to cut through it to get to quote unquote the real structures? And, and I don't I don't understand why none of us asked that question. Yeah, I mean, as you're saying it now, yeah, I also myself, I didn't question it. Um, I just listened. But I, I think, you know, that questioning actually sometimes comes years later when you know you don't listen to everything that you're told and you start to think well maybe things are different to what I was taught um, because that's often the case you know things develop and we start to learn new things um, so we have to be open-minded and and ready to learn about all the new things that people are discovering and researching now Fascia is something now that, that I know in the last few years has become quite popular um, in research. Is there quite a lot of research um, in, in animals or are we mainly sort of looking at humans and extrapolating from the, the human studies that have been done? I think most of it is that. It's been uh, studied extensively in the uh, humans and I think most of that is being carried over into the animal world. 
if 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 there was one thing that you would want to for us to 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 take home about fascia, what would it be? I think it's that the fascia is impacted by every other system in the body, and in turn, it impacts all of those systems as well. And it serves not only as a structural highway of our body, but really as the informational highway of the body. And tell me about doing fascial release. Um, so it's very different to massage or is there, are there similarities? It's really very different. With massage, there is usually a very specific routine. You you touch every single part of the, the body, no matter whether it's human, horse or dog. You go in a pattern and you uh, stroke a certain number of times or you use a certain kind of stroke in this area versus that area. Whereas with myofascial release, we do a specific evaluation and we target really the areas uh, of difficulty or restriction and um, that will impact through the fascial system, through this informational highway, it will impact the rest of the body. So we don't always touch every single part of the body, but we do impact the entire body. And, and tell me, you know, when I was discussing now, when we were doing the, um, the anatomy dissections, you know, there were places where you know, the fascia would, is adhered. Are those the type of areas where you would be treating? Yes. Um, you know, we, like I said, what we do is one of the things we do during evaluation is we palpate and feel for these areas of restriction. And so then that is the area that we would kind of target. And yes, it'll feel, I always tell the students, it'll feel like a BB or a walnut, a piano wire, a guitar string or rock salt. Um, and when you feel that and you combine that with the rest of your evaluation where you found that maybe um, there, there's a pain response there as well, or the owner has said, um, you know, he can't maybe um, extend that leg as much as he usually does or as much as the other leg does or that kind of thing, then you can, you can pretty much um, determine that that is an area of, of fascial issue. And so those restrictions, what actually causes them? Uh, it's a dehydration. Uh, when there is an injury in the area, you get a spilling of what are called the uh, proteoglycans uh, from the area and a dehydration in the area then causes it to harden. And so then we're able to palpate it. And, and, and the mechanism of doing the myofascial release, does that work to actually help to rehydrate that area? Absolutely. And, and how does it do that, Ruth? So through, through I mean, what's the, 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 the pathophysiology behind that? <laughs> well, that's a four hour lecture. <laughs> uh, but uh, and it is. That's one of the lectures in the uh, in the class. It's a four hour scientific lecture um, where we we describe how the fascia uh, is released through the myofascial release and how that can help bring hydration to the area. All right. And if you could say it in one minute, can you? Oh, let me think about this. Um, if we think about one particular cell, it does not directly communicate with systems such as the cardiovascular system or the um, lymphatic system, um, but it has to communicate through the uh, ground substance, which is part of the fascial system. Uh, and that ground substance is made up primarily of proteoglycans, which are little sponge-like hydrophilic uh, structures and when there is a an injury you get a spilling of the proteoglycans uh, that means you get water loss from that area which is you know as soon as those spill you get inflammation in the area right around there um, the the cell is able to send a message to the central nervous system that there needs to be a repair process and not only will the brain send down the uh, reaction of guarding, but will also send down fibroblasts to begin the healing process. With myofascial release, we are working with a piezoelectric tissue 
um, which will respond to compression in an area. Our hands create the mechanical pressure. The body turns that into a chemical reaction. This starts the flow of ions and assists with this healing process. Wow, okay, well done. That was four hours in one minute. Um, yeah. Okay, <laughs> a, lot, a lot more complicated than I thought it was. Um, okay. Chatting about fascia, you know, and just compensatory issues. So this is also something, you know, that we weren't really taught a lot at vet school. And um, I, I have problems with my lower back. And, um, you know, I canoe. And when I'm in the canoe, I, I often to try and compensate for lack of strength will tend to lean forward. Um, and then when I get out of the boat, I have really just a lot of discomfort in my lower back and literally that I can't stand up. And my physio um, said that she actually used the term creep. Um, and, you know, my thoughts are that is, is a fascia um, that is causing that. And once I sort of stand up and stretch it out, then I'm fine. Um, is, is that something that sounds like fascia to you? She uses the word what? Creep. She called it creep. When, when you basically keep in one position and then the tissues, you know, um, basically stick in that area until you stand up. Um, and my thoughts were it must be my fascia sort of over my lower back um, that is causing causing that discomfort. Because once I stand up and then stretch it out, then it's fine. Or maybe it's muscle. Well, I think it's a combination of the two, because one of the things that you learn during the scientific lecture is that you really cannot have a muscle without the aggregation of all the fascial tissue. And that's why it's called myofascial, right? <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> And, you know, and I, I don't know, I, one of the things that comes to my mind, one of the things when you ask the last question about, um, you know, um, um, what's taught in the class, one of the things I say is how do you combine myofascial with release with other treatment modalities? And, um, you know, like for your low back, if you were a patient of mine, I would probably do some myofascial release, but then I would instruct you in what are called McKenzie uh, extension exercises because, if you would do like five or 10 um, standing extensions prior to the canoeing, and then immediately when you get out of the canoe, plus if you do that throughout the day, because think about your job, you are a veterinarian, you're leaning over a treatment table a lot. And so you have a lot of flexion in your life and the, the body's fine with that as long as you can get, you know, some balance. And the way you get the balance is by introducing the extension. Yeah, exactly. You need to, I'm keeping my, my body in this flex position way too mm -hmm. much. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I hear you. And and just chatting about sort of posture and things like that, you know, um, how how much does is fascia um, impact on posture and postural changes? Um, in And I'd love to chat about humans because I think about myself um, as well as um, our patients. It has a huge impact um, because, you know, a lot of times what will happen is if you get a fascial restriction and you don't get it addressed and it's really causing you a lot of pain, you're going to, you know, try to get away from that pain. And in doing so, you're going to be compensating someplace else. And eventually the whole system is going to be kind of almost in a breakdown situation. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, that's about the time that a lot of people, you know, seek help. And uh, so then you've got, a, you know, you've, you do have the postural issues. But again, you combine other modalities with the MFR. You try to give the person the relief with the MFR. But then they're the they're the really the top of the food chain as far as taking care of this problem. They've got to do the exercises that you teach them to get that good posture back and to maintain it and not to get back in this bad situation again. Yeah, I mean, I'm guessing that you'd have to do um, a lot of movements stuff because obviously we get into these compensatory patterns that get established, and we have to break we have to break those the, those patterns together with releasing the the, the fascia around. Absolutely. Are you going to be attending the class in uh, next month? 
Oh, I'd love to, but I'm not. Um, so for those of you that are listening, um, Ruth is actually here in South Africa, and I would love to be coming down to, to meet you, Ruth. Um, she is um, doing a course um, in Himanis, um, where we've actually got a holiday home. So maybe if you're there and we're there for the same time, um, I might be able to pop over and come say hi and meet you in person. I'd love that. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your course and what you're going to be offering? Well, it, it is about 40% lecture and 60% lab work where we actually are hands on with the dogs. Uh, I do do um, several lectures. One includes that four hour scientific um, lecture. Uh, we t I teach an extensive myofascial evaluation of the dog. I mean, we all are already doing certain types of evaluation for the dogs. Um, but this is OK. Add to what you're already doing ways of uh, evaluating for myofascial restrictions. And then I teach techniques to address restrictions throughout the body and how to combine myofascial release with other treatment modalities. And, you know, that can include exercises, uh, proper body mechanics, um, you know, anything along those lines. Sounds absolutely fabulous, Ruth. And, and I believe you're also um, an author. You have two books, too. I do. One is called Facilitated Healing Through Myofascial Release, Putting the Pieces Together for Horse and Rider. And the other one is called Canine Myofascial Release. So for those of you that are interested um, in attending the course, um, we'll, I'll put a link in the podcast notes, as well as those of you that are interested in any of those two books. Do you, do you ship um, internationally with those, Ruth? I do. Okay, perfect. Ruth, thank you so much. Um, when are you actually out here? When are you in South Africa? What are your dates? I arrive on May 25th. We begin the K-9-1 class on the 26th. It goes through noon on the 29th. We then start K92 uh, at one o'clock that afternoon, and it then uh, finishes on the 31st. And then I will be teaching the equine MFR1 on June 2nd through the 6th, and MFR2 for equines on the 8th through the 10th of June. Okay, wow. So there's quite a lot of learning going to be happening there. Um, I will try my best to get down to Hermanus um, so I can pop in and at least meet you in person, Ruth. Thank you oh, so much for your time today. And is this your first visit to South Africa or have you been before? Oh, I've been several times. Okay. And it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Oh, it's a lovely place to go, Hermanus. Yes. Wonderful, Ruth. Have a lovely day and look forward to hopefully meeting you in May. Thank you so much. Vet Rehabbers, thanks for listening to my podcast. Don't forget to click the subscribe button and it would be great if you could leave me a review. I want to know what are you doing on the 15th to the 17th of November? It is our Vet Rehab Summit, which is our online virtual conference for veterinary rehab professionals. Find out more information at onlinepetals.com.